want to welcome all of us to uh, welcome all of you to the church today. Um, Carolyn Wood said, since there's so few of us, we're going to go over to her house. So uh, we're going to start church over there in about another 15 minutes. I got to get her to smile more. You know, I can, I, she smiled. That's good. Um, anyway, no, we're going to stay here. And. Uh, uh, I just want to let you know, we didn't get it in the bulletin this week, but we always have to let you know two weeks in advance, so we're going to have it in next week and the week after. We're going to have a business meeting January the 18th, January the 18th, and, in, and so far what we have in that, in that discussion is um, Mr. Doan has put together the budget, the annual budget. As you look here on the inside of the bulletin, you'll notice that our budget is, is uh, behind. Um, the reason why we're surviving is because all departments that had money allocated to them did not use their money. I guess you could say praise the Lord, but you could say, uh-oh, because we don't want to be a dying church, right? No. We want to keep a, be a working church. So um, he is going to re, uh, give us a budget um, at, that we will vote upon on January the 18th. Um, the other thing is that we are going to, at that time, begin to discuss... Um, future designs of this church if we want to do designing and re-modifications -modif for this church, uh, that would be the time that we will discuss that. And uh, also we're going to discuss a little bit about the trees in front of the school. Um, the reason, as I said last week, our septic failed uh, was finally determined by the men who installed the tile field that only the first 50 feet of our of the tile field of the school septic system was working. Why? Because most of it was filled beyond that with roots from the trees, solid. So there was no place for the liquid to escape. And I can confirm that that's probably the case because what backed up was not anything smelly. It didn't have any smell to it. It was just liquid that backed up into the bathrooms. But, it, but that cost us uh, about $90,000, that little bit of a, of a problem. And... Uh, 21 of it was paid by the insurance company, but the rest of it will have to do it alone, which means that um, those of us who, who are, uh, see the need to keep the church afloat will, will all need to contribute to this, to this loan that we have just for the school alone. But um, there's also a discussion about what to do with this building also. So um, from what I understand, uh, January the 6th, which... Uh, is a Monday after this, the Monday the school starts up again. Uh, they're going to come in and they're going to uh, do the flooring in this half of the of the this half of the of the church underneath. Not not uh, yeah, the opposite of Tom Cart. Yeah, this side of the, of the church will be done, except for the room where the communion is. I think that's going to be held until further discussion. But they're going to do the floors in there. So and they're going to put the molding around. Um, that side of the school, the baseboard around that side of the school. And so, January the 6th, um, hopefully Jerry and I are not the only two that will be available. Um, but we are going to slowly move the stuff across the room, but we cannot do that unless the teachers are here. Teachers are not here until January the 6th. So I don't know how that's going to work uh, with the teachers. Yuki, is Yuki, I saw Yuki earlier, but... I don't know how that's going to work, but um, that's going to be a process. So, But there'll have to be a general cleaning of the floors before we move anything. Um, that probably can be done. Um, probably that Sunday of the, of the 5th, we probably can start cleaning the floors because they don't make any mess when they, put the, when they glue the baseboard on the, on the room. Uh, there's no dust or anything like that. Uh, we did have to replace the vacuum cleaner downstairs because it got filled up with drywall dust and ruined it. So um, Anna told me she purchased another one just to let you know there are expenses in this church to try to keep up with things. But uh, drywall dust and vacuum cleaners don't do well. No, it's pretty fine stuff. But um, So uh, with that, I have nothing else I need to discuss. Uh, uh, this is not Dick Susie, in case you know. This is a wonderful volunteer Mr. Tim Adams, who is one of our elders who is going to be filling in today. So thank you, Tim, for filling in today in such a vast crowd that's here today. Sure, sure. Absolutely. Thank you, Pastor. 
All right, I think it's time for our song service. Um, I'm trying to see who all of our participants are. I believe it's Anna and Jim Doan. All right, our first song, we're going to have O Come All Ye Faithful. It's page 132, and I'm not sure if it's on the screen, but um, and we're going to sing the first and last verses. song will be Silent Night, Holy Night. Uh, I think it's 143. 
and we'll stand for that, please. Silent night, holy night, all is calm, all is bright, round yon virgin mother and child, holy infant so tender and mild, sleep in heavenly peace, sleep in heavenly peace. Silent night, holy night, darkness flies, all is light, shepherds sing Alleluia Hail the King Christ the Savior is born Christ the Savior is born Silent night Holy night Silent redeeming grace. Jesus, Lord, at thy birth. Jesus, Lord, at thy birth. Silent night, holy night, wondrous star, lend thy light. Merciful Father, we thank you uh, for another Sabbath day, for the last Sabbath before another year comes before us. So, Father, uh, we thank you for the year that you've given us. We look forward to the year that's coming. But today, Father, on this holy day, we pray for your spirit to be with us, to invigorate our hearts, that your spirit may dwell upon us, that our worship may be worthy before your throne. Bring your angels here among us, Father, to fill in uh, the pews. And, Father, may our hearts truly be glad uh, that we and joyful that we have a God in heaven who loves us in Jesus' name, Amen. Be seated, please. And now it's time for our children's story. And so the kids will, children will come up and collect dollars, which helps, or any funds that helps our students that need a little defraying of cost for school. Um. Said the Savior tenderly, Let them come, let them come, Please don't send them away. I have time, let them come, Let them stay.
Good morning and happy Sabbath. We have planned the juniors and early teens, because Charles is out of town, to do the 13th Sabbath. So guess what? We're going to do it right now, because these kids had worked diligently the last two Sabbaths on this project, and we even have a great friend here from Texas named Henry, and I'm so excited he's here because I know his dad. I went to a banquet with his uncle at Memphis Academy. I just got reunited with the whole family today. I thought it was exciting to see Henry here. Okay, so um, this quarter we've been talking about Daniel. How many of you kids know who Daniel was? You kids right here. And what were his three friends' names? Well, one of his friends was named um, Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego. All right, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Okay, so lesson six was about eat, drink, and be healthy. Freya, sit down, please. So lesson six was about Daniel and his three friends when they went into this place, and their first real test of if they were going to worship God was a table filled with the most expensive foods, kind of like your Christmas dinner you just had. But there was a lot of meat. And Daniel and his three friends, they said, we don't eat meat. And he said, we want you guys to be strong and healthy. We've got you the best fatted calf here. We've got all this wine for you to drink. And Daniel and his three friends shook their head and said, no, please test us, your servants, for just 10 days. He said, give us nothing but vegetables to eat and water to drink and exercise. Let us exercise in the fresh, open outdoors. Then compare our appearance with the young men who eat these royal foods and treat your servants in accordance with what you see. So what my kids did was we were, were working on the last two Sabbaths, the word celebrations. And this Tuesday night, many of you are going to have a what? Celebration for what? New Year's, New Year's Eve. And we want all of us, adults included, to think about celebration time. And we want you to think about how you're going to celebrate in the new year. And because we're Christians, we're going to celebrate with healthy things. C is for choices we make. The choices we may not always see the end from the beginning, but your choices always determine your destiny. Healthy choices bring positive effects. Unhealthy choices weaken and hurt those around you. And who did Daniel and his three friends want to make? What kind of choices? What kind of choices? Good choices. E is for exercise. Jackie here does a lot of good exercises. Exercise gives you energy, endurance, flexibility, strength, a firm body, a glowing complexion. If you exercise outside, you will do better. L is for liquid. What is liquids? Water. That's right. Start your day with an invigorating splash of cold water or pamper yourself with a warm bath for cleanliness, relaxation, and to invigorate your body. E is for environment. What you do and where you are is important. A good climate with rich soil and pure water, clean air, and atmosphere where you can survive, celebrate the gift of life-giving environment, and do all you can to restore, protect, and preserve your environment. B is for belief. I believe in Jesus as my Savior and that he died on the cross, and Shari has a picture of that. B is for belief. Okay, you can tell me in a minute. Sit down. Faith itself is a gift, and if you believe and give Jesus, your heart and mind, he will enable you to make positive choices. Celebrate belief, the gift that sustains. R is for? Rest to help your brain. Rest to help your brain. Rest. R is for sleep and rest. Correct. R is for sleep and do not skip out on a good night's rest. Celebrate the refreshing gift of rest. A is for? 
air. He's exercising in the air. Your body will have abundant oxygen if you're outside in the air. T is for temperance, choosing right from wrong. Alcohol, tobacco, and other drugs are the wrong way to go. In place of chemical depressants, get your relaxation from sunlight, water, and sleep. I is for integrity. We need to learn to be honest with ourselves in order to avoid self-defeating denial. Celebrate integrity with your friends. O is for optimism. Having a happy, optimistic outlook on life will help you and others in the new year. N is for nutrition. In every meal, you choose the colorful fruits, breads, whole grains, nuts and seeds, legumes. And S is for stewardship. A steward is a manager, not an owner. People who claim it's my body, so it's nobody's business but mine, fail to recognize that everything pays a price when you have an unhealthy choice. But if you choose a good choice, we are given one healthy body, and good health is a gift from God. Preserve it and invest it. And that's what Daniel and his three friends did. What happened at the end of the 10 days? They were healthier than the other boys in the palace, and everybody noticed Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, Daniel all had made the best choices in life. They all chose to be healthier. Not only did they look and feel good, they were smarter and wiser than the other students who were not taking care of their bodies. All right, let's have a prayer. Marnell, would you like to pray? You want to pray? And Marnell, would you like to pray too? Okay, we're going to let Marnell start, okay. Dear Father, thank you for this day. Bless everyone for a good day. Bless for everyone to stay safe. Bless for everyone to have their Bible in their heart. And amen. God, just please be with us as we go to the, this day and that everybody will be safe as we travel home and that we can always come to church so we can... If anybody's sick, help them to not to feel better and not be sick. And that anybody that got in a car wreck, just help them to get better. And that <laughs> I love you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you. So our scripture reading this morning is Galatians 6, 2. The one that was printed was not accurate. Um, Bear ye one, another, one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. And may God add his blessing to the reading of his word. It's now time for prayer requests, and I'm going to jump in here and uh, add one real quick before Miss Julie gets started. Um, I went up to see Wayne yesterday evening, and he has found out that they're going to actually start doing rehab with him again there at the facility he's in. Um, I'm a nurse and work in the field, so my understanding is they kind of have to have a 60-day break out of skilled side, which is the rehab side, before they can do that. And because of his walking, the physical therapist said they see his progression, and because he's progressed, they want to get him back in therapy and see if he can progress even more. So that's, he's really excited about that, and that's some real good news for him. Good morning, everybody. We don't have a huge list this morning, which means good news for everybody and their health. However, I have been given two this morning. Um, there's a lady called Gloria Hale, who comes from the Fayetteville Church, and apparently quite a few of you know her. She had a stroke on the 26th, and she is in Grady, and they have removed a clot from her brain. 
so please keep her in prayer. Yesterday, I think it was, Ron Doan had a fall and he's injured his right knee, so please keep him in prayer. The rest of our prayers are ones you've heard over and over, so I'll just run through them quickly. Doris Tunis, Yuki's mother, Kaneko Jones is Yuki's mother, and Jace, Judy Presnell's grandson, Vincent Drake, Dion Young's parents, Lawanda de Morris, Pastor Larry Becker, Bill Brendel, Levi Goodwill, Virginia, and David Tunis, Michelle, who's Cookie's granddaughter, Becky, sister's Pat, I'm sorry, Becky's sister Pat, Claire, who has ovarian cancer, our school, the teachers and the children, Chris and Cleveland Wells and Brenda, Jan Henderson, who is with us this morning, praise the Lord, and the good news we heard for Wayne Woods, Linda Abercrombie and her parents, Bob and Carolyn Woods, and the Goldborn family. Please keep them all in prayer. And I'll take this opportunity to wish you all a happy new year because when we meet again, it will already be there. It's hard to believe it'll be 2020. Now it's time for our prayer song. prayer. Let's kneel together for that. Dear Father, thank you for your love and watch care over us. Help us to um, be a light in our community for you. Help us to individually remove the log from our own eyes so that you we can uh, be a better light for our community and with you and display you to others. Help us to um, be attentive to the needs of those around us as Christ was and help us to reach out in love to others in our sphere of influence. Please be with the pastor and his word today and help us to be receptive to that word and help us to um, allow the Holy Spirit to intervene in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. have to use the mic. Uh, so our offering call this morning is for loose offering is for Georgia Cumberland Ministries. And so, um, you know, God calls us at the end of the kid's story here, the letter that stood for S stood for stewardship. And that's something he calls us to is to be good stewards, not just of our money, but also time, um, resources, sharing with others. He calls us to be a good steward in a lot of ways. Um, but there's the benefit to us is if we are a good steward, um, we get the benefit. It's not that he needs our money or he needs our time and everything. It's we get the benefit from it. So, um, guys, do you want to stand for offering? Dear Father, thank you for um, the gifts that you give us. Um, in not just money, but also in resources and in your uh, mercy and grace. Please help us to return those gifts to you and help them to be multiplied for your service. In Jesus' name, amen.
Thank you for that beautiful music. Jeanette, that was a beautiful song she did. <clears throat> that glitter. Let's pray. <clears throat> Loving Father, as we open our hearts this morning to your word, may we be inspired, may we be uplifted. May we find peace knowing we have not only a God who loves us, but a God who wishes to dwell with us. May we know that this earth that we live in is a temporary place. May we be reminded that our hearts need to be drawn more toward home in heaven than anywhere else. Bless us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to invite you if I get my clicker, Thank you. I want you in, to invite you in response to my statements I'm going to be making, where we say, thank you, Lord, okay? If you have food in the refrigerator, clothes on your back, a roof over your head, and a place to sleep, you are richer than 75% of the world. If you woke up this morning with more health than illness, you are more blessed than the million who will not survive this week. If you have never experienced the danger of battle, the loneliness of imprisonment, the agony of torture, or the pangs of starvation, you are ahead of 500 million people in the world. If you can attend a church meeting without fear of harassment, arrest, torture, or death, you are more blessed than 3 billion people in the world. If your parents are still alive and still married, you are very rare. If you hold up your head with a smile on your face, and are truly thankful you are blessed because the majority of Christians in the United States do not say, thank you, Lord. God loves it when you and I are thankful in our hearts. He just loves that. And not only in our hearts, but as we express it openly, as not only a witness to ourselves, but in a very... Um, tactful way in the midst of other people. You see, my friends, Mike, it shut off, guys. Yes, a thankful heart is the basis of Christianity. What I just said is key to Seventh-day Adventists. A thankful heart is the basis of Christianity. Well, I thought that Jesus' death on the cross, him living his life on this earth, was the most was the most in basis of Christianity. Yes, my friends, but it has no validity in your life if you, my friends, are not thankful for it. Because if you're not thankful for it, that means you're not going to repent, right? I mean, truly repent. I mean, there's an acknowledgement of, you know, yeah, I'm a sinner, I repent. Or somebody who really knows and really recognizes what, what God did for them. That's, that's the basis of Christianity, for every Seventh-day Adventist here, as we talked before, EQ or thankfulness, as, as our Sabbath school teacher brought out today, the, the cherishing of God will bring a thankful heart. And it will be a growing experience as we, as we purposely try to do that on a regular basis. Without it, we will not grow. And this is true, too. Without it, we will not grow in a deeper relationship with God. My friends, if you're not truly thankful, if you are not uh, if you're not truly emotionally attached to God, not just an acknowledgement, because the devil knows that he's, he's out of the park, right? And he's not saved. An acknowledgement of something is not really where salvation is, but actually the acceptance of it, the cherishing of it. Without it, we will not grow in a deeper relationship with God, and we will not grow in sanctification. You can take that to the bank. I didn't read that in a book anywhere, but I know from my own life, 
As I shared many times with you, God pointed that thing out to me, and that sticks with me like glue, I'll tell you. My Savior, I do. I hope you want to come close to your Savior. I do. I really hope that that's something that's real. The only way that's going to be is if you have a thankful heart. Bottom line, that is so foundational that we sometimes, as people of the book, know the book, but it's not in here. And if you want to, and you say, well, you know, I just give up. I'm not a growing Christian. I, you know, that, that, that stuff of overcoming sin, you know, that's a fairy tale. Well, I'll tell you, my friends, I'm glad I don't smoke anymore. I'm glad I, I no longer drink a case of beer every weekend. I'm glad I don't cuss anymore like a sailor as meat cutters do or as people in the butcher departments do. I'm glad I don't abuse my wife and, and I'm glad I cherish my wife. And I, I'll tell you, those things are so foundational to growth, Christian growth. The reason many Seventh-day Adventists do not grow is because they don't have a thankful heart. You, you, got, you got all that, that theology down. You got all that, that understanding down, so much so that you're sick of it. Because you're finding other things to be more interesting in your life than Jesus Christ. I know I'm not talking to everybody in this room, but I'm talking to some of you. I know that. But I'll tell you, sometimes in these last days, we have to be confronted with reality. And the reality is the Laodicea church really does not have much emotional, no, much, not much thankfulness to God because they think they've got it all. They think it's theirs, but in reality, what they have is a gift from God on a constant flow of basis. And because we think we somehow earn it or it's ours, it, you can lose it just like that if your heart turns away from Jesus Christ, just the way it is. Dependency upon God and growing in Jesus Christ all is based on a thankful heart with the understanding that Jesus coming into this earth and dying for me is something that we need to be thankful for. And it has no merit in my life, has no value in my life. I'm going to be just as lost as the guy that, 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 that is out there being a mass murderer. I'm just as lost. Because I'll tell you, if I don't want a relationship with Jesus Christ, you know, what am I? I'm definitely not a Christian. I'm definitely not. You know, the Bible does say that there will be those in heaven that will say, Lord, didn't I do this? Didn't I do that? Didn't I do that? And he says, go away from me. I never knew you. I don't want that to be true for my life. So I intentionally every day, being a melancholy, I intentionally every day purposely remind myself of being thankful for things and not taking for granted the fact that I have an automobile that's, that's uh, 13 years old, uh, that really works still really well with the help of my friends, and I have a wife who loves me, I have a roof over my head, I don't have an expensive home, but I'm grateful for it. Whether you own it or not, that's not the thing. There's many people in the world that don't even have a roof over their head. They're sleeping out in the dirt. They're sleeping under a tree. They're sleeping under a rock. They're, they're, they're out living in the streets of New York City, of Atlanta, being who knows what's happening to them, these little kids. And, and the thankful heart is one that God can use to develop empathy for people who are in need, who have burdens that, we, that you now begin to recognize uh, need your help and my help in life. Yes, in fact, the more we purposely seek to thank Him every day, not just at the morning prayer and the evening prayer or a quick prayer that, you, that if I sit around you for, for two months, we'll hear the same words over and over again for your prayers. And I, am, I have been guilty of that. But my friends, if, if you and I are just caught in rote prayers where we say the same things, um, I was in a church one time, and one of the elders in the church, I knew when she got up, I knew she, what the words were going to be exactly what she was going to pray about. Her prayer was, was the same all the time. It was no different than the rosary. It was sad, but, you know, she was a strong-willed lady, and I could, she wouldn't let me help her at all. Um, she was a doctor, and, you know, sometimes those people, professionals, they, they tend to be uh, very self-assertive, and, uh, but anyway... That's a sad story in itself, but if, I find, if you find your prayer, as I have in my own life, where you're saying the same thing all the time, you're using the same words, and it's, it's almost like reading a paper, my friends, 
Ask God to help you. Because you're not praying from the heart. We've got to pray from the heart. That's why when you pray in the morning, your prayers are fluid. They change every morning because a thankful heart will bring to your, to your mind to be thankful about things that, that, that wouldn't happen otherwise. Wouldn't happen otherwise. Colossians 3, 12 through 13 says this. Therefore, as the elect of God, who's that? That's us, right? That's not just back there in the Colossian time. That's you and me. So this is good stuff, right? How many think this is important stuff? Yeah, we're all the elect of God. Some of, you, some of you I know didn't raise your hand because you didn't hear me. But therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved. Wow. But, and we all know that, that we're, all, we're all broken people. So when God puts in me and calls me elect person and says that I'm holy and beloved, wow, God thinks a lot of me. He thinks a lot of you. Because he knows we, we, we want to be more like Jesus. He knows we want to love more people. He knows we want to be his people. He knows those things. So he has the right, because he knows our intent of our heart, to call us the elect of God, holy and beloved. And he says, because you are that, because I've already appreciated that to you, Hal, put on, put on. In other words, be intentional about it. You have the choice of either putting it on or saying, I don't need it. I've already got enough. But that's always the present tense, so you're never done putting it on. Right? There's always more to be put on. Never be a lay to see it in your mindset. Be ready to always put on more tender mercies. Enlighten your, enlarge your sphere beyond your family to the needs of people beyond your family, behind those who are blood-related to you. Include other people in your life. Put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another. Oh, yeah, people are a pain sometimes. Man, you ought to get 30 people together in a room for three days. Even I become a pain. When kids use my couch as a, as a trampoline, I tell them, stop it. And when they don't stop it, I get their dad to tell them, stop it. And when they don't stop it, I, I have to ask them, come here, please. Listen to your father. Bear one another. And I'll tell you what, you are being shaped and honed constantly because life is such where we rub against each other, right? It's not always tutti fruity, sweetie, sweetie stuff. But be aware, you can respond in a sinful manner. There's no such thing where you are able to belittle people or downplay people because they don't do what you think they should be doing. That's a hard thing to do when you have 30 people in the same room for three days. I wish that could happen to all of you at your house. And forgiving one another. I forgive you for using my couch for a trampoline. And you know how you show forgiveness? You don't tell them forgiveness. It's the way you treat them. They should know better at that age. You know, at seven years old, you should know better not to do those kind of things. Seven, right? Six. Five, even. Bearing with one another... And forgiving one another, if anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you. You see, that all comes from an emotional quote. That all comes from cherishing. It's not a, just a straight judicial thing. Because judicial thing is when somebody violates a law, they get punished, right? So this is not all... This, sometimes we get that law thing where we don't want to show mercy. Even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. It's not an option. And I'm learning about that. And I hope you are too. Because when life rubs against you, it brings out things you don't like about yourself. But it doesn't have to stay that way. But the whole foundation thing is based on those last ten words there that are the foundation of that whole text. Even as Christ forgave you. 
See, it's not about you. It's about what He's done for you and what He is doing through you now. You're living out Christ in your life. You're, you're, you're witnessing to people about you claiming to be a Seventh-day Adventist that it makes a difference versus those who are not. Because you're the people of the book. And it says you must do that. It's not an option. And sometimes we say unintentionally or ignorantly, probably more ignorantly than anything, is because we don't immerse ourselves in God's Word daily that we don't see these musts and see as in, as clearly as we need to. Because I'll tell you, it's an outside power that comes in and does these things for you. But if you're close to that, you're going to think you're the greatest person in the world and everybody else is worse than you. And, you know, why aren't you like me? Well, I'll tell you what, maybe people shouldn't be like you or me. They should be like him. But, but saying I'm sorry is a big deal when it comes to Jesus Christ. Enough lecture there. When Jesus walked this earth, he revealed the loving character of God, did he not? He revealed it. And we can find many reasons to be thankful because of what he's already taught us in the scriptures, right? I mean, how, how he was so merciful. If God is merciful to people who are sinners in the Bible, that means he's merciful to me, you and me too. And if we really believe that, my friends, that he's faithful and just to forgive us for our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, not just judicially, but in our hearts, our attitudes in all those things, it will be so. Because even John the Baptist's disciples didn't even know about the Holy Spirit. And, so that they, and when they were taught about the Holy Spirit, they suddenly were inundated with a, with a power like never before because they were open to it. See, we, we are powerful people in our own realms. We can say no to anything we want. And we can shut off influences by God anytime we want. I don't want to do that, do you? No, I want to be open. I want to be open to God's Word. I want God to lead me in my life. And only as you really cherish it and want it to happen in your life will it happen. Just head knowledge isn't going to make you change before Jesus comes. You know, there are unfortunately going to be some Seventh-day Adventists who are going to be lost because they never cherish God's Word which means they never cherished God, which they never had a thankful heart, which means God will say, I never knew you. I don't want to be that person. I want to be, I want to be a person that, that, that God says, well done, good and faithful servant. Don't you? Well done. And, and the reason he says well done is because, not that you're well done or medium or rare or anything like that, well done because you let God into your life. You said yes. That's more probably what it is. It, it's more well done because you said yes than all the things you did because you couldn't do all those things you did without him. You know what I'm saying? That's kind of, kind of high up there, isn't it? Well, I'm surprising myself sometimes. You know, even a donkey can speak sometimes. You know what I'm saying? Yes, when Jesus came to this earth, he showed the character of God. He showed he was the Messiah. We all know that. But that's not all the story. That's some, some denominations just get, get all locked down in this Messiah and Yahshua and using the Hebrew terms and no, no Greek terms because, you know, that's pagan, they think, and all these crazy things. Yes, he showed he was the Messiah. That was important, my friends. He was the deliverer. But he wasn't just a conqueror of, of, of you know, with swords and all that. That's, you know, God does do that. I know he does. He makes the earth worth, worth open up and swallow and defeats the enemy for Israel and for you and me. But... He, it shows that he can defeat the devil. You don't have to be trapped in yourself. Now, there are some organic problems that people have. They do need medication. I'm not talking to you if you have to take medication for your depression and all those things because of organic problems. But I do know that me being a melancholy, I, I can be depressed, but I don't need medication because I know I, I have the Lord to help me with my with my melancholy attitudes. That's, or, that is, that is a, that's character tra characteristic of some of you even in this room. And some of you in this room are so fly, fly, uh, so fly by the seat of your pants that you've got to get more serious about Christianity. So there's, there, there's, there's all these things. We all, got, we all got edges that need to be rounded a little bit. I mean, there's nobody in here that can get away with that. Nobody. Jesus walked this earth and, and he showed that he was the Messiah and showed that he could defeat the devil and that he was who he said he was. And he not only showed that he could defeat the devil, he also showed God's tender mercies and kindness of what he really was. 
And he not only showed his tender mercy and kindness, he also showed that he valued fallen human beings and his aching heart for them was revealed constantly. And it still exists for us even today. John the Baptist sent some of the disciples to ask Jesus an important question. Are you the Messiah? Because I'm confused. And sometimes Christians today are confused about really about Jesus, that you need Jesus in your heart every day. We need him every day. Don't no longer be confused about that. Don't be one of those people that where God says, I never knew you. There's no reason for that to happen to anybody in this room. There's no reason for that. And it's not because you're in the wrong denomination. That's a, that's a fallacy. Anybody who says that they didn't, that the Seventh-day Adventist church is a, is a, is a cult, is, is crazy. I have studied all the denominations out. I'm not the smartest person in the, in the school, but I know enough the fact that I've studied them all out. I was forced to study them all out when I was in seminary and discovered, my friends, that, that where you are in those pews right now and the things that are being taught to you in Sabbath school and from the pulpit and in your own personal devotion in life as you prayerfully seek God in your life is the best place to be. Play with, with this, oh, this, I don't need this, I've outgrown this. I talked to a person that was an amazing person a few days ago. He claims to be an atheist. Claims to be an atheist. And, I, and, I, I, and he says, and I says, an atheist? I said, well, you know, and I was very careful what I said because Cinder was right there. I says, an atheist? What do you mean by that? He says, well, I've outgrown that stuff. I says, outgrown that stuff? What have you outgrown? He says, I don't need Jesus and all that stuff anymore. That's all, that's all morality. The Bible is a book of moral values, and I've got my own moral values now. I'm beyond all that stuff. And I stopped the conversation there because I knew, you know, I didn't know him that well. And I do not have the right to be confronting people I don't know. I haven't earned my, their trust for me that I really care about them. So when you talk to people, my friends, be careful that you don't think that, that, that you're laying it on them and you're, do, you're doing the right thing. You only do it just as Jesus did. You have to get their permission to talk about things. They have to learn, they have to, learn to trust you before you show your your intention to help them they they don't think you're helping them if they don't know you believe me it's not the time to argue with people and so i backed off and um i took a, a secondary route because i wasn't going to know that person very long and i i began you know thanking him for all because he's helping me peel potatoes and everything and i says I, I thank you very much i says for all of your help i uh, i really appreciate all you've done for me and um and i I try to find the positive things to talk to him about and say, you know, I says, you know, um, I really like you. I said, you know, you, you really, and he is a not very likable person, really is. I mean, good looking, all those things. Everything a, 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 a woman would look at and say, you know, that, wow, he's a nice man, you know. But as we learn our lesson today, Tim, don't be unequally yoked either. I mean, that's the most dangerous thing you can do is to, is to, is to fall in love with somebody who is not a Christian. I mean, that would be a disaster. Not only just for you, but for your kids. And when it comes to Sabbath, you know, wow, good luck. Because their religion more than likely is going to be football and sports and things like that or, or whatever. I mean, okay. What did Jesus say in them when they said, are you the Messiah? Are you the Messiah? And they really were meaning it. Because their man was in prison right now, and he, he, he promoted the Messiah, and he, he did all of these things that he was called to be. And, uh, you know, behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. And, and all of those proclamations were done. They said, are you? And did, what did Jesus say? Well, uh, yes, I am. And let me uh, show you theologically why I am, and let me pull, quote some scriptures to you. No, what did he do? He says, look at what, I, what, uh, look at what, I've, what I've done and what I say. And then go back to him and tell him what you've seen and heard. 
And after you watch and see, tell John. In other words, he was saying, I know that you need more than proclamation. You need to see action. You need to see it in, in shoes. You need to see a Seventh-day Adventist living out this so-called theology they've been throwing at me. Uh, do you keep Sabbath? You know, you tell me about Sabbath, but, you know, what are you doing on Sabbath? You know, you claim, you know, you're different from, from the rest of us because of the Sabbath. You know, how's it going? You know, are, are, you, are you avoiding taking that gift back or are you avoiding going out to eat in, in public where people see you eating in public and you say, hey, I thought you keep the Sabbath. I thought you don't do business on the Sabbath. Oh, you know, well, you can go out and eat and do all those things too. And, you know, once you start creeping into those things, my friends, pretty soon you're out doing all kinds of stuff. Oh, I forgot to get, I forgot to get milk. I'm going to the store and get milk. Or I forgot batteries. I'm going to go buy batteries. My friends, don't get involved in that stuff. You're creeping, you're, it's called a creeping compromise, as, as Joe Cruz mentioned. It's not a good thing, my friends. God still loves you when you do those things, by the way. But be careful about how you show your love back to him. I know I'm making a lot of people mad today. I'm sorry about that. But, you know, I have to... T you, I know you want to know what the Word says, so I'm telling you what the Word says. And I'm putting scriptures together of all the years of experience I have. Believe me, I, I'm, I'm, I'm with you, folks. I'm, I'm, I'm challenged every day, you know? Not just, not just with what, you know, gathering with other people, but everyday walk in life. You know, God wants His Word to make a difference in your and in your, in my life. He really does. He wants it to take action in your life. He wants it to, to change you. He wants it to grow you. He wants you to be sanctified. He wants you to, to be a transforming person in a process of transforming. Colossians says again, let the word of God dwell in you richly. Let it dwell in you. The only way you're going to let it dwell is if you're exposing yourself to it. Don't rely on your memory. Your memory is not good enough. I don't care how smart you are. I can't even remember where I put my hammer the other day. My wife found it on top of the refrigerator in the garage. Believe me, don't trick yourself. Let the word of the Lord, the word of Christ, dwell on you. Allow it. To, ask for it. God will not do any. Ask and seek, and you shall find. He's knocking on the door. You got to open the door. We got to let Him come in and dwell with us. Dwelling is, is, a, is, a, is a continuous action thing. It's not where he's a, a picture in the corner, but he's actually among you. He's actually a part of your life. He's actually the, the one that, that's, that's there, you know, not making dirty laundry, of course, like you and I do. He's not eating your food, but he wants to be there. He wants you to, to be a part of, your, of everything you do, even what channels you watch on your TV teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. We have structure that God wants us to use as a church to help us in, with, in this indwelling of Christ, to, to make it more real, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord, to the Lord. And whatever you do, do in words or deeds, do all in the name of the Lord. So whatever you do, whatever you do, whatever you do, do all, everything, in the name of the Lord. When you get in an argument with your spouse, recognize that your situation with that spouse is a precious relationship and say, I'm sorry. Because you want your connection, your relationship with your spouse or with your children or with your family or with, with witnessing to other people, you want it to be Christ dwelling in you. Don't stand in between you and Christ. Every action you do, open the door for Jesus to take over. Do all the name of it. There's no excuse to be for you to come through. No excuse for you. Because you have a sinful nature. You're carnal. You know, as I said before, the carnal man has one foot in the kingdom and one foot in the world. Many Christians walk that way. God wants you to be a spiritual person where you have both of your feet purposely planted in the kingdom of God. Yes, you're going to mess up. But my friends, God says, do all in the name of the Lord. Giving thanks to God. 
You want to do all in the name of the Lord? There's going to be many things to give thanks for if you do. Lord, thank you for helping me deal with that, that anger I had in my heart. Lord, help me deal with that, that negative feeling I had toward that other person in my heart. Lord, thank you for, putting, for telling me that I need to tithe before I pay my bills. That, and the reason that, that, that that's a challenge to me is because I'm not a good steward of your money. And if any of you feel you need to be better stewards of your money because you ran your credit cards up, there's a man back there with a sweater. You can talk to him and he can guide you to things that will help you. Sorry to volunteer you, Rob, but you're the, you're the man that's the representative in this area of um, Ramsey, right? Giving thanks to God the Father through him. You see, it's through him. It's not something you generated on your own. It's something that's inspired. You know, the time is coming when, when your, your will becomes so entwined with God's will that it's as if, you know, you're doing it all yourself. That your thoughts could cut, just spurt out immediately along with His. But it's all done through Him. Give thanks to God that He has made a way out of what the devil has done to this earth and continues to do to this earth. Thank God for what he's done. Give God the credit for everything he does. Not as a, as a rote prayer, my friends. Don't give him, as I said before, but a prayer that comes from the heart. Not a mindless expression of, a, of something you've memorized that sounds good in front of other people, but something that you want to, that you really think about. When you give thanks at the, brec at the, the breakfast table or supper when you're with other people, Make it mean something, my friends. There's a lot of things that you can thank him for, not just the food, but thank, thank him for, for providing things. But thank him also for the, for the people around the table. The, you know, thank him for that too. Why not? Because, because fellowship is cherished by God, and he wants you to cherish it. Let me make a sanctuary among my people that I may dwell with them. If that's important to him, he wants that to be important to you, even with people that disagree with you. I mean... We had our ex-spouses with us, both of them, and we were happy. We were happy. Everybody was happy because life goes on, doesn't it? Don't live in the past. And, and, not, and I'm not going to belabor that anymore, but you know, you could, carry some, you could cherish some bad thoughts about somebody. Don't carry that burden. Cast your burdens upon him, right? His yoke is easy. Those things are true. That's a promise, my friends. And whatever you do comes because of contemplation. This creates the thankful heart. Something that is not, and not one human being alive today or even exists with, without recognizing that God is, is involved in your care and your providential, providential um, being. Yellowstone, how many of you have been to Yellowstone? I have, what an amazing place. I mean, Wow. It, you go from one part of the park to the other. It's, it's changing vistas all the time, an amazing thing. Well, we were to Yellowstone a couple times, Cinder and I, but she's been there many, many more times before I even knew her. But there's huge trees there called sequoias. They're around 300 feet. The big ones are 300 feet tall and maybe 20 feet across. They're huge trees. But, the, but, even, but you wonder why something so tall can stand and not, you know, because that, the higher it gets, the more leverage you've got to tip something over, Right? You know, just like when you, use a, when you want to get something out of the ground, you use a fulcrum. You use something really long to, to move something really easy. Well, you, the taller a tree is, the easier it is to topple it because, you know, you get the wind up there and the leaves and, you know, it can pull the roots out. But you know what sequoias do? The roots intertwine. They have a shallow root system. It's like a great big plate underneath the underground there of their roots and they intertwine. So when the wind comes and the storms come, guess what? They hold each other up. What an amazing uh, statement that God made through the sequoia tree to you and I. They stand strong and tall and, ex and last a long time because of the, of the help of the other trees keeping them that way. You know, God wants us to do the same thing with each other. He wants us to, to, to be involved in each other, to carry, us to carry each other's burdens as Tim read earlier upon with share each other's burdens so we may hold each other up and and we need to look at this next verse verse about daily walking in the bible let no there again let that means you can let right 
Everybody got that? You can let corruption into your life. You can. It happens just like that if you let it. Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth. But let what is good for necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the hearers. We all need to hear good things, don't we? We all need good things to happen in our life. We hear so many bad things about the weather and all the things that go on. We need to hear good things happen in our life, that it may impart grace to the hearers. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, but whom you are sealed, by whom you are sealed for the day of redemption. It's all about God and about Him interacting in our lives. He gets all the credit. And this is all done because of the Holy Spirit who says, You are saved, Hal. You are saved. Uh, all, just put your name in there. You, because once I start naming names, I've got to name everybody. And don't ask me to do that because we'll be here for all afternoon. But God wants us to know that there are many things for us to be thankful for. That you can live a transformed life and He gets the credit for it if you allow that. Not because you're a smart person or educated person or a wealthy person or whatever. It's because he has done that for you because you have let it happen in your life. We all need encouragement and, rep and repetition. We all need that in, in our lives. In a third world country, a hospital visitor in this third world hospital noticed a volunteer nurse tending the sores of a leprous patient, Tim. And that does still happen today. There's still leprosy in the world, right? And this visitor noticed this person tending a leprous person. Lepers do not smell good. Rotting flesh does not have a good smell to it. The nurse was removing the stinking bandage. Not only that, it's also contagious from what I understand. Is that right? The nurse was... She had all, all the sterile field between her and the patient, of course. The nurse was removing the stinking bandages and cleaning the dying flesh from the leprous area as a leper laid there and had to allow her to help him. She was then rebandaging the sores with clean bandages when the visitor stated to the nurse who was doing the dressing, saying this. Can everybody repeat that with me? I wouldn't do that for a million dollars. I wouldn't do that for a million dollars. The nurse smiled and looked up into the eyes of the visitor and said, I personally know that if this poor soul had even two million dollars, he would gladly pay you, sir, to do this for him. But he doesn't have a cent to his name. That's why I do it for nothing. That's pretty powerful, Tim, isn't it? That's a nurse who loves the Lord. Because that wasn't easy to do. Philippians 2 says this, Let, there again, let. A lot of these lets in the Bible. And we wonder why we're not growing as a church, we're not, why we're not becoming more sanctified, why not we're coming to light on the hill. It's because we're not letting. Because we don't feel the need. Because we're not in the Word every day. Or not prayerfully in the word every day. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, because we're pretty good at that, but also for the interests of others. That's not me talking, it's the Bible talking. Ellen White once said this, Jesus reached the hearts of the people by going among them as one who desired their good. And that wasn't phony stuff either as one who desired their good. Do we desire the good of other people beyond our own interests, beyond the interests of others? I have to ask myself that question all the time. I really do. You know, when, when, when somebody comes into your area, to, to your sphere, and doesn't respect your sphere, and does a lot of physical damage and emotional damage, do we still love them? Do we find their, do we, are we interested in helping them in a way that would be courteous and kind? Or are we just going to tell them, that's, you know, leave my stuff alone, this is my stuff, and you take care of your stuff? Are we, going to, are we going to try to help them grow, to develop boundaries, to develop all those things that they want? Benjamin Franklin once said this, 
If you don't want to be forgotten as soon as you are dead and rotten, either write things that are worth reading or do things worth writing about. Pretty good, huh? That guy was pretty, pretty witty, Benjamin Franklin. Does God care about how we trust, how we treat each other? How we treat each other? Does He really care? Does He? Does it? I mean, does it matter to Him how we treat people who are the elect, the holy ones? Bear. Now, this is not a bear that you find up in north northern Georgia. This is not talking about dressing in skimpy clothes. Bearing has to do with endurance. It has to do with putting up with things. It isn't just carrying them on your back. It's the continuous confrontation of somebody in need that you continuously respond to, as I know one of you in this room does very well at. Two of you I know do very well at. I'm sure many, many more do that. Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. What do you mean, preacher? You all got to keep Sabbath, preacher. We all got to keep Sabbath. But you see, there's this thing called the spirit of the law. And the letter of the law kills, right? And bearing one another's burdens involves the spirit of the law. It involves the character of God. Love the, the Lord thy God with all thy heart and soul and mind and thy neighbor as thyself. You see, the letter of the law kills, but the spirit of the law with the letter of the law is powerful. And when it becomes a part of my life, the way I act toward other people, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of God, that tells me a whole lot more than, than a legalistic Adventist or somebody who just obeys God. But it has to do with the fact that obedience that Christ did was much more than obedience. It was the fulfillment of the law because Jesus loved. Jesus bore other children's burdens and that fulfilled the law. You know, if the law is a statement of God's character, Jesus dwelling in you and me, then my friends, obviously, it's not really a burden for us to carry other people's burdens as we grow and study that. You know, a study was once done by Bello, Belloc um, Breslow. The study involved 700 professed Christians. And he found an interesting finding, Tim. This is a good one for you, too. You're a researcher. You, there were... An interesting finding was this, that he discovered among all those professed Christians, the ones who were active members in a church and who were actively seeking to build up other people had a three times lower death rate because there was less stress in their lives. Um, feel good when you do things for other people. James tells us this, if anyone among you thinks he is religious... Sometimes we have a higher opinion of ourselves than it's reality. If anyone among you thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his own heart, this one's religion is what? Pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their trouble and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. We have to ask ourselves, how are we doing in that category are we living beyond ourselves, beyond our own families? And are we really seeking to say no to things that are on our TV or to the world around us? Are we purposely seeking or the things that we, how we treat ourselves even? What I'm about to, to share with you is unfortunately something we may all be guilty of at one time or the other. And when I say that, I'm including myself. I find the best sermons are ones where I admit that I am growing just like you are. Because that's the only time it carries power. I hate, I, I should say hate, I really dislike somebody who stands before you and, and claims they've got it all together. And then years later we find out that person was secretly doing something. I, I, I hate um, hip, hypocrisy. And I ask God to help me never be a hypocrite to you. It's vulnerable when, when I admit to you that I'm growing like you. I know it is, but I also need to tell the truth. We're all guilty of this. What is it, preacher? Tell me. Sometimes we can be wrong when we don't do our homework before we jump to conclusions about other people. 
Let that sink in a little bit. Sometimes we can be wrong when we don't do our homework before we jump to conclusions about other people. We jump before we get all the facts. Or we may even have uh, the wrong facts. That's the hardest one when you've got the wrong facts. You find out that your facts are wrong. That's an embarrassment, by the way. You know, there once was a, a conductor who was on a train. And uh, when he got, he, when he, and, and the, part, the part of the conductor on a train is not the engineer, it's the conductor. They collect all the tickets and they either punch them or they collect them um, because some people have to move on to the next, you know, pick up and move on. So they collect them and they help them get on to their next, next um, uh, entrance on another train. But this conductor was on a train and he took everybody's tickets from them. And when he got all those tickets together, he noticed something really shocking. He quickly went to the microphone and announced to all the passengers, Everybody, please prepare to get off at the next stop. You're all on the wrong train. And naturally, everybody was shocked, as sooner than I would be. But later, it was found out that the conductor, after doing his calling to the next station, later was found out that the conductor was the one who was gotten on the wrong train and not the passengers. <laughs> well, that would be an embarrassment, Tim. Be careful, my friends. When you're criticizing others, you may end up being the person who is wrong and others are innocent. You can damage somebody really badly and they may incorrectly and unbiblically never get over it and actually leave their Christian experience or the church because of that and yes it's true my friends there are some things that need to be left alone when it comes to us being judgmental about other people period even if they are wrong when it comes to salvation when the Son of Man comes in His glory and all the holy angels with Him, then He will sit on the throne of His glory and the nations will be gathered before Him and He will separate them from one another as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. And He will set the sheep on His right hand but the goats on the left. Then the King will say to those on the right hand, Come, you blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. From the foundation of the world. You see, my friends, sheep and goats naturally herd together. They do, and only when the shepherd finds the right time does he shepherd, does he separate the sheep from the goats. Because they both benefit from being in the same pasture, do they not? They both receive the same nourishment. But the time comes when they need to be separated. And the Lord is the only one who knows after all the facts are straight, all the true facts, and all the future um, providential leadings of those people, and their future acceptance of Jesus Christ perhaps, only he knows at that time what needs to be done, which is best for them. So be merciful, my friends. Because we may have angels among us unawares that are testing us and seeing how we do in that department. And he uses his own criteria to determine his act of separation at that end. At that end. Matthew continues, says, For I was hungry and you gave me food. This is for the sheep, okay? The ones he said, come in, you know, well, good and faithful servant. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger. I, 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 right? I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was a prisoner. I was in prison and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer to him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and take you in or clothe uh, and naked and clothe you? Or when did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king will answer and say to him, Assuredly I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. He calls them my brethren, by the way. That's a close association, the human side of Jesus Christ. You, you're, you're related. He's the new Adam. You did it to me. Yes, my friends, something very important is being said here. The sheep they fed, they clothed, they watered, they visited, they cared, but the goats didn't, did they? Matthew goes on, then he will say to those 
on his left hand. Depart from me, you curse into the everlasting fire. Prepare for the devil and the angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you did not take me in. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they all will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you? hungry or thirsty, or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison, and did not minister to you, that he will say to them, say assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch, inasmuch as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Yes, my friends, we need to think beyond denominations, don't we? We need to think about other people besides our families and our churches. We need to think about people as God thinks about people. Jesus tells us in verse 40 that when you care for others, you care for him. Jesus devoted his whole life to being involved in other people's lives, did he not? And Jesus dwells in you, and he calls Douglasville to do the same as, as we are entering these last days or in the last days. First Thessalonians says this, Therefore, therefore, comfort each other and edify one another, just as you also are doing. He's saying, you Thessalonians, worried about people dying and people not you know, going to heaven and all those things, because they thought Jesus was coming in their lifetime. And, he was, and, and Paul is telling him, no. Therefore, comfort each other and edify each other, knowing that you got it wrong, but God hasn't forgotten you. And he says, keep doing the things that you Adventists are doing, and keep growing, which involves keep growing, and keep expanding your sphere of influence, and continue growing in burden carrying. Don't say, you know, I don't want any stress in my life. That's not my problem. I got enough stress in my whole life. There's such thing as good stress and bad stress, and when you help somebody, it really does make a difference in your heart. Just as you also are doing. So God, I'll tell you, he knows that the Thessalonians were not perfect people. There's not one person that God, that God wrote to through the, the apostles that were perfect people. But yet God knows that he wants to be perfect in your sphere as he is in his sphere. And it involves the growing that goes in your life. And God says, keep doing what you're doing, folks, in the Douglasville Church, but recognize don't be complacent. Keep growing so that God can continue to use you in changing times where the difference that you make in the world will be what it really takes to prepare people for the second coming of Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Loving Father, thank you for your presence today. And Lord, there is not one perfect person in this world, but thank you for the encouragement in Thessalonians that, that you, you say we're, we're already on that road, but but boy, Lord, we know as we read the scriptures, we're far from being what we want to be. So help us, Lord, grow in our, in our desire, in our, our cherishing your word, and cherishing Jesus Christ, and cherishing other people, that we may continue to become more and more like him, where we seek the needs of other people in their, in their caring, so that we may be able to share with them who Jesus really is. Not just in actions, but in words too, in Jesus' name. Amen. We are going to close 11.59. Hey, not bad. Now, if I was in a different culture, I could preach till 2 o'clock. <laughs> you could. Uh, Aren't you are, glad I'm not? No, I would take it. Our closing song is Not I But Christ. <clears throat> Let's please stand for that.
supplying not I but Christ my strength and health to be Christ only Christ for body soul and spirit Christ only Christ So our benediction will be from Romans uh, 15, 5 to 6. May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another in accord with Christ Jesus, that together may one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. May God add the, his blessings to the reading of his word and help us to carry this out in our lives. Amen. <clears throat>